This past month alone, I made just under $60,000. I have the word doctor in front of my name, beautiful wife, a nice house, I'm happy pretty much every day, and I generally really love my life. And none of this is said to brag. I'm no better than anyone else, and I certainly didn't start out this way. I was born to two parents who divorced by the time that I was four years old. A year later, my mom, who had full custody of me, lost her job, and her and I were homeless. We lived on friends' couches and in motels for about a year until we finally got a place in the homeless shelter. At eight years old, my dad finally won custody of me, and he brought me to live with him and his new wife, who also had kids. And this was a home filled with a lot of baggage, a lot of drama, and a lot of pain. In my teenage years, I definitely rebelled. I had long hair, skinny jeans, I skateboarded. All I did really was drink and do drugs. When I was 18, I signed up for a community college just so that my parents wouldn't kick me out of the house. I literally failed every single class that I signed up for. I was on the road to ruin, and if I continued down that path, I would never be where I am today. Now, why am I telling you all of this, and how did I get to where I am today? Well, this week's question is, how important is your inner circle or tribe for happiness, and how did you find them? I found myself getting depressed and angry when I follow many of the evidence-based experts, and then I feel more happy slash hopeful slash positive when I spend my time listening to people like Hugh Ruin and Kyle Gillette, who represent science well, but they don't shit on people who don't have a meta-analysis and back up every word they say. Advice would be appreciated. The first part of this question talks about your tribe or your inner circle, but the thing that's really interesting, he goes on to talk about content creators as if they are part of his tribe or his inner circle. You know, it's kind of like people he hangs out with. At the surface level, you may not consider the people People whose content you consume to be part of your inner circle, but in a way they really are. And that's because the internet is an extension of the collective conscious. Through the internet we traverse space and time. For many, the people on the other side of the screen are their circle. Now before I talk about the impact that my inner circle or even the people who I consume affected me, I want to dive into a little bit of the social theory and philosophy behind how those who we consume or those who we interact with will actually impact us. One fundamental concept in understanding the impact of social environment on identity formation is the social construction of reality. Philosopher Peter Berger and sociologist Thomas Luckman propose that reality is collectively constructed through social interactions. This theory suggests that individuals develop a shared understanding of reality within their social context, influencing perceptions, values, and beliefs. As people interact with these social environments, they internalize shared constructs, shaping their identities. Our identities are literally shaped by the things that we surround ourselves with. Albert Bandura's social learning theory discussed the role of observational learning and modeling in the acquisition of behaviors and attitudes. He explained that social individuals learn by observing others in their social environment and intimate behaviors that are reinforced or rewarded. We watch social interaction, we watch how people are, we watch how others react to them and how they reinforce or suppress those behaviors, and we mimic that. This is all backed up by Nietzsche's famous quote where he said, He who fights with monsters should be careful, lest he thereby become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Nietzsche discussed the transformative nature of engaging with certain ideas and narratives. The metaphysical abyss represents the challenging or dark aspects of the human experience. And Nietzsche warns that prolonged exposure to such themes can shape and mold an individual's psyche. Which is exactly what this subscriber is explaining here. What we consume directly impacts who we are. Every second of every day we're taking in tons of information, little bits of information here and there which are slowly molding who we are. And this can go both ways. We can improve our identity by the content we consume, or we can negatively impact it. But the main issue with the content that most of us consume on a daily basis is our extreme bias for negativity. There's a reason why Paul Saladino takes his shirt off and screams something absurd like vegetables are killing you, and why Lane Norton does the same back to him, basically just as absurd like a bully on a playground, bullying him, telling him how he's wrong. It's because negativity sells, but why? Because negativity bias has historically kept us alive. The human brain has evolved prioritize negative information due to its potential survival value. In ancestral environments, being alert to potential threats, dangers, or negative stimuli was crucial for survival. Individuals who are more attuned to negative information were better equipped to identify and respond to potential dangers, thus increasing their chances of survival and reproduction. We're wired to respond to negative inputs more so than positive ones. So when Gary Brecca comes out and tells us that insurance companies are hiding the secrets to health and longevity, we definitely click on that, we comment on that, we engage with that, the algorithm picks that up, it pushes it out, he's able to sell more products, so he does that on repeat. So we know that the content we're consuming is shaping us, and we also know that we have this extreme 
extreme bias towards negativity, and so does the algorithm, because the algorithm can literally be replaced with the word audience, and the audience loves negativity. We love negativity, whether you know it or not. At a subconscious level, you're gonna click on the negative thing much faster than you click on the positive thing. And David's saying that after consuming content like Lane Norton's, he's feeling depressed, and how could he not? I mean, it's a sound message. It's definitely evidence-based. He has really good content, but he wraps it up in so much negativity because that's what gets the clicks. And this is where becoming aware of the content we consume is so important. And now it's time to tie that back into my story. So at around 20 years old, I decided I'd had enough. I still had all those Fs. I was just fucking up. I actually got in trouble with the law, a minor thing. I did something stupid. I'll tell you, I actually, I was with some friends. We were in the mall and I'd put on a shirt and I was like, you think I could just walk out of the store like this? You think anyone would notice? And everyone's like, no, no, you'll be cool. Dare me to do it. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do this. No problem. I don't know why, why the hell would I think that was a cool idea? But I walk out of the store, next thing I know someone's grabbing my shoulder and it's this like undercover mall security dude who caught me shoplifting. So I got in trouble and I just thought to myself, dude, you are fucking up your life. You have all these Fs, you're a skinny, scrawny piece of shit. You're a sad excuse for a man. And actually it was right about that time that the movie 300 about the Spartans was coming out. So I looked into them. I wanted to know who the Spartans were and what they were all about before I went to the movie. And I got really, really intrigued by what the Spartans were doing. And I thought to myself, that is what a true man is. Whatever I am, I don't know. I'm just scum. I'm a waste of oxygen at this point. I need to become a man like that. So I actually got these tattoos on my wrist, which say, with it or on it. They actually say etani epitan in Latin. That means with it or on it. Because the Spartans, when they went to war, they would come back, or they would tell themselves, come back with your shield or on it. So basically meaning you come back victorious holding your shield, or you come back dead on top of your shield. No surrender. The only options are death or victory. And I thought to myself from this point on, those are my only options. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to do something good for this world and do something good for myself, my family, my loved ones, or I'm going to die trying. I have no other options. I will do something great. So how does that have anything to do with the content that I was consuming? Well, at that point, I knew that I was definitely highly insecure and I lacked confidence. And how could I have been confident? I had no evidence to support my claim that I was something great. I wasn't. My only evidence told me that I was a piece of shit. But I knew to obtain my goals, I needed to become a confident person. I needed to have a lot of self-worth and pride. So I did a few things, and one of them was specifically listening to a lot of rap music. Now, I like rap, but I really just put it on blast and repeat all the time, specifically Lil Wayne. The old mixtapes, those were the best. In Lil Wayne's music, you could almost describe him as being like hyper conceited. I mean, most rap music, right? I mean, they just talk about how good they are, how much money they are, how many bitches they have, how many drugs they have. The entire thing usually is just a hype session for themselves, even on stage. They've got like 25 people up there, which I don't understand. There's so many people up there, but everyone's hyping them up, but it's all about, I'm the best, I'm the best, which isn't necessarily needed all the time. But at that point in my life, I needed to be repeating to myself, I'm the best, I can be the badass, I can have all the money. I guess I didn't really need all the bitches or all the drugs or anything like that, but I, I picked and choose the part of the content that I was going to repeat. And I loved his pride, I loved his confidence, his assertiveness, and I just continued to put that on repeat. I also went back and got really into Dragon Ball Z and started kind of following the creed of the Saiyans, like Vegeta. I was gonna have a lot of pride, a lot of confidence. I knew that was needed to become successful. And on top of being filled with pride and confidence, I also wanted to be intelligent. I wanted to be respected when I walked into rooms and I wanted to be able to hold conversations with other intelligent people. I knew that I wanted to obtain a doctorate, literally the highest degree in the land, so I knew that I was gonna have to become an intelligent person. Back then there was this company called The Great Courses. It may still be around, but essentially what you could do was buy Ivy League college courses. They came on CD. And I would listen to them in the car while I was commuting to college. Because at this point I, I started back at college and, and I would go on to do very well. But what I would do is on the way I would listen to The Great Courses. And back then, you young kids may not remember this, but we didn't have CD players in the car. Or I didn't have CD player in the car. You had to like hook up portable CD player, Walkman, up to a cassette, and I'd plug that into my car and listen to it. But I listened to the great courses every time that I was in the car. So I was either listening to rap music and telling myself that I was a badass, or I was getting educated listening to Ivy League college lectures. That combination of academia and confidence shaped me into the person that I needed to be at that time to become the person that I wanted to be. And at that point, I would continually use content as I moved through life for what I deemed identity curation. We all go through different seasons in life that require us to be different people. Sociologist Irvin Goffman described life as a stage, just a theatrical play. We're constantly playing a different character depending on what stage we're on. 
And I completely agree with Goffman. I've always looked at every part of my life as being a certain stage, literally a theatrical play. I'm on a stage and I need to fit a certain role. And when you realize that the content you consume can shape you, you can leverage that to your own benefit. You can use it to become the actor in the play that you're currently in. Maybe you're in a season in life where you feel like you need to be more cynical and evidence-based, and that's where consuming content like Lane Norton's can come in handy. Or maybe you're in a season in life where you feel like you care about what people think about you too much, and that's when you leverage people like Alex Ramosi and his almost nihilist point of view. So David, I hope I kind of answered your question. I think I sort of did in a roundabout way. I really wanted to highlight the fact that what we consume does shape us. And you kind of answered your own question there because you said that the content you were consuming was turning you into something that you didn't like. So you changed the input. You're obviously highly self-aware and you could actually realize that the inputs you were taking in were having an effect on who you were as a person. Being self-aware grants us the capacity to discern the interplay between our thoughts, emotions, actions and gives us the ability to shape ourselves into the person we want to become. The problem arises when we're not self-aware and we don't realize that what we're consuming on a day-to-day -day basis is impacting who we are. But content isn't the only input that shapes who we are. In this video, I actually tried to live like a standard American, eating what they eat, drinking what they drink, sleeping like they sleep, and I think you'll be shocked at the results.